Hello and welcome to everyone who is joining us this evening. Um, and we are currently live on YouTube and Facebook. So wherever you're joining us from, very, very welcome to you. Um, my name is Jack Yates. I am the communications officer here at the Royal Armouries. Um, and tonight we are going to be discussing guns in space, as I'm sure you're all more than aware. Um, and just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, it is incumbent on me to talk about a few other events that we have coming up in the very near future. Um, we have a lecture tomorrow, um, which is on horse armor. It's part of our Friday afternoon lecture series, and that's at two o'clock. Um, and that's on our Facebook page, so do check that out. Um, we also have two more uh, live streams next week on Wednesday the 26th and Thursday the 27th. Um, they are on Seek Weaponry and some Seek Weaponry that we have digitized um, and it's all uh, it's uh, linked with the uh, Anglo-Seek Museum project um, and then on Thursday we will be interviewing a movie armorer uh, called Larry Zanoff who's worked on a lot of big Hollywood titles which uh, Jonathan will touch on in a moment. Um, it's also worth me saying that there will be a time for questions uh, at the end of the stream. So please uh, post those uh, in the Facebook or the YouTube comments as we go along. And Jonathan, myself, will try and get to as many of those as we can. Um, and I would just like to say as well that the Royal Armouries is a charity and we very much uh, welcome any donations uh, that anybody can spare. We've been hit as hard as anybody else um, throughout coronavirus. So yes, any donations would really be welcome at this time. Um, so I think that just leaves me to introduce our curator from the museum, uh, our keeper of firearms and artillery, Jonathan Ferguson. Uh, hey, Jonathan, how's it going? It's going well, Jack. Thank you. And uh, could you tell us where you're streaming in from? It looks somewhere uh, a little bit out of this world. Yeah, that might look like a, a stock backdrop, but actually I am in near Earth orbit in order to test out some of the weapons involved. Fantastic. Well, Jonathan, uh, if let's kick off. Um, why are we here talking about guns in space? Right. Well, um, without rehashing too much history that um, fans of the museum might already know. Um, and I should first of all say I'm very happy to be talking to you guys tonight, but also to be hosting the event on the 27th with Larry, who's an absolutely fascinating guy. Um, I'm really looking forward to that as a fan myself. Um, he's going to cover some interesting films, some interesting props. Uh, it's going to be really good. Uh, but the inspiration for, for that and for, for tonight was our make-believe display, which opened in the museum in Leeds last October. Hopefully, uh, people who are watching in the, who are in the UK had a chance to see that before the late unpleasantness. Um, if not, hopefully it won't be too long before you can come and visit us to see that. So that's a, a, a small display, but it punches above its weight. It's got lots of, lots of cool stuff. And that's the cul culmination of five years of uh, researching, collecting. Um, we, we've run a few events around this as well. Popular culture, arms and armour. Uh, it's the main way that people today encounter our subject. You know, once upon a time, it was guys in tweed jackets studying uh, ancient weapons. Nowadays, it's, you know, uh, video games, films, TV. So uh, that's really, that's why we're here today. Uh, we ended up with 68 objects from small and, and cheap to um, big and expensive. Uh, big like the, the Lancelot armor. Uh, that's not why we're here today, uh, tonight, of course. We ended up with um, three really important space guns. So my first piece is the pulse rifle uh, from Aliens and Alien 3, although we don't always like to talk about that. But I am, I, I've become a fan of Alien 3 over the years. Um, so that was designated, a uh, fictional designation, of course, the M41A. And it has its own sort of fan history uh, since, since it came out in the movie. But it's hugely significant in the film. Practically everyone's um, rocking one, uh, unless you're a smart gunner, of course, but I uh, haven't got time to get into that tonight. Um, and I think for me, the most fascinating thing about it, apart from just being really cool, um, is the, the sort of subtext that it represents in the movie. So the, the Vietnam War um, strand that, that runs behind Aliens. If, if, you don't, if you're not interested in it, it doesn't hurt the film. But if you are, it's there. 
So the, the um, camouflage is a form of, of camouflage that was worn in Vietnam. The helmets were uh, adapted M1 helmets, which were still in use in Vietnam as well. And the pulse rifle is, I always, I think of it as like a, a caricature of, um, although it's quite mean looking, of the AR-15 um, XM177E2, if you know your um, assault rifles, um, distinctive looking weapon in its own right, fitted with a, an under barrel grenade launcher, which was a very important piece of new technology in the 70s uh, when, when it was released, uh, used in Vietnam. So James Cameron, um, the director of Aliens, uh, super interested in hardware, military kit, and he put a lot of work into researching the pulse rifle, both as a prop and as a, you know, a, an echo of Vietnam era and 1980s era technology. So he makes it super compact, which is where rifles have gone today, funnily enough. It's got that um, distinctive carrying handle shape of, of a, an AR-15, but extrapolated to the future. The sliding stock of those carbines that the special forces were using, and that really cool pump action grenade launcher. Um, how did he achieve that? Well, the original design, as, as some people might know, was built on an MP5. Most movie guns, even today, are built on real guns. And you put them in some sort of casing, or in this case, you put them in a casing, but you also weld bits of other guns to them. And that's how we display the pulse rifle in make believe um, when you get a chance to see it. So we have the pulse rifle itself. We have the Thompson submachine gun that it's primarily based upon. And that was selected by Cameron because of the muzzle flash, or rather the MP5 that he was going for, um, famous for in films like Die Hard, of course didn't have a big enough flash. So we're very used today to seeing um, very dramatic um, uh, muzzle flash out of, our, out of firearms. And, and the nine millimeter cartridge in blank form didn't produce enough flash, whereas the old World War II Thompson gun did. Um, so that was, but that problem there is it's, um, the MP5 is quite sleek and futuristic already and black and, and spacey. The Thompson was not, the Thompson is this, iconic clunky piece of gangster and, and um, Second World War military firepower. So how, what do you do with that? Well, they already had the, the design disguised with this distinctive shroud, which is in some ways the most important part of the prop. I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, concealing the Thompson and then to, to totally change the look of the gun and, and to produce the grenade launcher effect, which is used to such brilliant effect at the, in the finale with Ripley. Um, is they took a, a Remington 870 shotgun. If, if you, uh, again, if, forgive me for getting too nerdy. I don't think I can get too nerdy tonight, but, but there we are. Cut that down short, stuff it into another shotgun, the Spaz 12. Um, I think we'll have a, uh, throw up a couple of pictures of these two shotguns for you to see. Um, so you, you'll know the Spaz 12 from, well, things like Half-Life probably as well, but um, Jurassic Park used as intact as a shotgun. It's quite a cool piece of, hardware nonetheless um all they did there was chop the front end off the the um, heat shield and the big grip on the front that you used to, to operate it cut that in half stuffed the remington shotgun inside it so that it would have working parts and then they took uh, snap caps these are these are for dry firing shotguns with so you don't damage the mechanism and they machined this is all on the on special features for aliens if you want to go and dig that out later machine some shapes into them they put a cap on the end and this was your, your grenade and you carry some on, a, on your on your kit in the movie P uh, slide those into the what's actually a shotgun and then you pump it and fire it uh, in reality of course they're firing shotgun blanks when they do that and 45 blanks from the thompson gun you can even see the thompson magazine when they take the magazine out when hicks is instructing ripley in how to use this uh, fearsome bit of military kit how they fit 99 rounds into that little uh, magazine, well, that's movie magic. Um, as is the, the, the counter on the side, um, which we might talk about uh, before we move on. So th this is, for me, the already, we've only done the first one, but for me, it's the ultimate in, in space guns. Um, uh, I don't think you can go too wrong with it, really. Part of a movement away from your Buck Rogers laser guns, energy weapons, which, although, uh, We'll, we'll touch on this in a moment as well in a slightly different way. Um, other movies had, had, had gone for the more gritty, grounded sci-fi look, but Alien really nails it by basically being a war movie in space. So it's great. And, 
And Jonathan, if if we were to see the the pulse rifle on the modern day battlefield, what what where would it kind of stack up? Would it be a, a useful piece of kit? And and what are its kind of key drawbacks as well? The, the funny thing about the pulse rifle is it's got this this really long legacy. Um, we, we did a video with GameSpot a while ago that people might want to seek out later. Um, uh, talking about this this weird afterlife that it has, and it shows up in games, obviously Aliens games, but used as a model in a few others as well. And it gets used in music videos. It gets um, it's DLC in, in in shooters and things. Partly, I think airsofters even sometimes will take the airsoft pulse rifle onto the airsoft field, which is, yeah. I think that speaks to its its believability. Obviously, it's a bit of fun, but. Um, it, it, because it's an extrapolation of 70s, 80s technology, um, it, including the caseless aspect, by the way, which I'll touch on in a sec, it does kind of fit in, the, it could fit in the modern world. In fact, if you look at things like, um, off the top of my head, uh, the FN SCAR uh, with a short barrel with the semi-modular grenade launcher, you might be able to look at, I think we might have pictures of one online, um, or, or the F2000, a bit more Halo, but they've gone that way. Um, and sometimes it's interesting to speculate speculate on life imitating art, art imitating life in a sort of circle. One day I'd love to interview some some designers about that. I mentioned caseless technology. Um, you nearly did see a caseless rifle, even more wacky looking than the pulse rifle, actually, in uh, around about 19, well, just would have been coming to service 1990, 1991. And that's the Heckler & Koch G11, which uh, is in, in Firearms enthusiast circle sometimes gets called the space gun because it really doesn't look like anything else. Um, in fact, I, I think if they put that in Aliens, it would have dragged down the sort of realistic feel of the whole thing because it's just weird looking. The, that very nearly went into service with West Germany um, when Germany was still um, split in two. And because of the reunification of the country, there wasn't the money or, or well, perhaps, the, I'm not sure about the need, um, Cold War was still coming to an end as well for such a high-tech, expensive, potentially difficult to maintain weapon. Um, so we, without going too much into the technical detail, when you hear the line um, 10 millimeter explosive kit tipped caseless in aliens that, that's supposed to fire from the pulse rifle, although you'll see the casings flying out of the gun, so actually it doesn't. Maybe they'll do a special edition where they remove that. Hopefully not. Um, the and the, sentry, and the sentry guns and the smart guns, I believe, are all supposed to be caseless ammunition. That's just a cool piece of techno babble, really, for, for the movie. But it does reflect, or it reflected in 1986, where future military, uh, where, where firearms were going. Everybody, pretty much everybody, thought that by 1990, 1995, we would give up on our metal cased ammunition. So if you're a Halo fan, you know that we still have 7.62 cased ammunition 500 years in the future. So Cameron was way out. Um, but as I say, 1990, the idea was you'd remove the case, you'd turn the propellant into the case and set the bullet into it. So that sets up all sorts of issues that I won't labor. Um, but uh, in theory, well, not in theory, in practice, it cuts down on about 40% of the weight of the ammunition, less weight, and it also makes it more compact. So smaller, lighter, you can carry twice as much. That's been the trend in small arms ammunition almost since the beginning. Um, so, but did they really solve the various issues? Heating being a big one, it's still unclear. So nobody has yet adopted a caseless firearm, but we've got another 180 years or whatever it is for <laughs> that to happen. <laughs> okay, well, Jonathan, I know you could talk about the Pulse Rifle probably for the rest of this hour long segment. So we should probably move on to the next object. What we is should. it, or objects I should say, and um, what are we looking at next? Yeah, so um, some people will probably be shouting at me saying, how dare you suggest that the Pulse Rifle is more iconic than the Stormtrooper Blaster, which is um, the first of two blasters from Star Wars that we were extremely fortunate to be able to acquire as part of the same program that I mentioned at the beginning, um, which was under, incidentally, that was under the um, Heritage Lottery funded Collecting Cultures project. Um, we chose to make that about movie props. Other museums used it for other purposes, but we were able to get some funding um, for these items. We had to we had to look elsewhere and find more because we never thought we would we would get our hands um, and therefore the public's hands on uh, Star Wars anything. Frankly, we thought we'd have to go for posters 
uh, maybe some concept art, something really small. I don't know, maybe the the, um, the bottom bit that fell off a lightsaber. You know, this stuff goes for so much money. We never thought we would go for anything Star Wars. But I was in um, Bapti and Co, the, the movie armorers, who incidentally also uh, responsible for the pulse rifle. Simon and Atherton, who worked for Bapti in those days, who has his own company now, uh, turned James Cameron's design into that amazing gun. Well, the same people, um, and in some ways a bit less adventurous, but they're just as iconic, if not more so, created a number of different blasters for the Star Wars movies, um, more than we have time to talk about. But the two that we acquired are the Imperial uh, blaster that you, you can see at the moment and the Rebel equivalent, which I'll come to in a moment. So looking at the 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 uh, what we tend to think of as the Stormtrooper blaster, I mean, these, these things have got their own names in uh, that, that have become official. Uh, possibly were official from the beginning, actually. Someone will probably shout at me in the comments for that. So the E11 is this, um, the, the iconic black Stormtrooper blaster. Um, and it's it's giving no secrets away to say it's just a st Sterling submachine gun. Both these guns actually are um, based on the Sterling submachine gun. And the, the the kind of the head scratcher for me there, looking looking backwards, I'm, I'm, I'm old enough to have, um, to have seen uh, Return of the Jedi um, when I was very young, although I don't think I remember it, the, the first uh, viewing of it. But um, the, these were, if you were a serviceman in 1977 in the British Army um, or one of the Commonwealth armies, you'd have seen that in the, the Stormtroopers in this outlandish space armor, and then you'd have seen the gun and gone, hang on a minute, that's the SMG, that's my Sterling, that's the L2A2 or L2A3. But they've done a, they've done a good enough job of disguising the outline of the gun. So. For the Stormtrooper gun, you've got the, the, the holes that, that, are, that are heat cooling um, uh, event, uh, vents in the shroud on the front of the, the Sterling submachine gun, nine millimeter submachine gun, fairly standard piece of military kit. Those were disguised with, um, this is my favorite bit of the whole prop, uh, draw runners from B&Q, specifically from B&Q for British viewers. And they were, they were, they were uh, heated and stuffed into uh, the front and the back end um of each um row of cooling holes and that does a good fairly good job of disguising the front of the gun unless you're an enthusiast the the folding stock which is actually super useful for actually hitting anything maybe this is why stormtroopers always miss don't know was left folded up um and and was never seen unfolded and that's resulted in the modern equivalents of these guns in the modern sequel films leaving that feature folded up and turning it into something else it's actually become a, tor a flashlight that sticks out of the front um, I don't think you see that in the movie but you fold down the what would be the back of the stock um, and a little flashlight pokes out the front um, so anyway that's that's going a little bit off the point because we we have uh, our two guns are from the original trilogy but it just it I think it shows how what a feature of the gun that folded up stock has become um, but most of the rest of the gun wasn't changed. Very important was to cut down the magazine. So that big curved magazine sticking out the side, that just makes you think action movie, submachine gun. So they cut those down. I'm actually, I'm fortunate enough to, to own one of these myself. It was given to me by, by Batsy. I'm very grateful for. I'll, I'll will to the armories in my will. Um, but we have um, the ones that are fitted to these two guns. And they're just five rounds. So you get five rounds of blank. And that gives you the, the realistic, not quite recoil, but uh, movement of the gun. Certainly for the hero um, actors, if you're an extra, you probably just have to mime it and go pew pew in your head and they would animate in the laser blasts. But for, for the for guns that are front and center, the idea was the gun firing blanks move slightly and then you have your laser blast coming out of the end. And it just gives that visceral feel of this is a real weapon and if you look really closely you'll see cases flying out uh, but with only five rounds the armorers had to then run in as soon as the director shouts cut and swap out the magazines and of course if they didn't do that in time they then had to just animate the laser blasts in so shortening the magazine was an important part what do you do about the top of the gun to make it um something other than just a, a 1950s submachine gun this was designed in 1944 by the way so much like the other guns in star wars it's not um, it, it's old hat, if anything. Some of them were contemporary, still in contemporary use in 1977. Some were already outdated. Um, the MG34 is used by stormtroopers as well, for example, German 
machine gun. But at the top of the submachine gun was, they, they simply took a piece of bent metal, you can see that on our uh, example, and wedged that in and, and uh, attached it to the rear sight. And they put on there a, an optical sight for a Sherman tank for aiming the, uh, the gun on the tank. And that just, that makes it look just sci-fi enough to become really iconic and really sought after. So we're really fortunate to have that. The, um, the Rebel uh, style blaster, which uh, jump back to that one. Um, that the one we've got is a bit of a mystery. Now we know that these two guns were, because there are only a set number of Sterlings in Baptiste's inventory, we would have been used in the, both of the first two movies for, for, for extras to use, if not the main, uh, main characters. As was standard at the time, Bapti, any armorer, would strip the guns after filming because you don't know what configuration they're going to be used in. This is a low budget movie, you know, didn't know it was going to be a hit. So um, they stripped it after the first movie. They also stripped them after the second movies as well. So these things um, had to be restored. All of the blasters that are out there now have been restored in one way or another. So these two were actually um, put back together using original bits also from the movie. Um, in the case of the Rebel Blaster that's on screen, um, the whole front end was custom made for that gun. Uh, they were restored for the new owner of Bapti back in 1999, knowing that uh, these things would be, um, you know, these things were important bits of, of film history for his own collection. And these are what I literally tripped over in that visit five years ago, or th four years ago, and said, are these what I think they are? And Long story short, they were, and so we ended up acquiring them. Uh, the The Rebel version is, as I say, a bit curious. It doesn't appear on screen in that exact configuration, um, and records aren't the best from 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 Bapti, So because they're moving on to the next project, this is, this is they're a, they're not a museum; they're they're a company. Um, so we believe this would have been made in this form. And again, the the base gun before it got chopped in half would have been used in Star Wars. Either Friends for Empire Strikes Back or for Return of the Jedi before filming moved to North America. We believe this is this is a new version of this Rebel DH-17, as it's called. Its original form was just a rubber, uh, a rubber stunt version. There wasn't a shooting version of it. And it was based off the of Sterling, but drastically shortened. And it was a pistol. You'll see it in the in the boarding scene in the original movie, and you hope. It's just a, a, a pistol with a silver front end and the sight on the top and no magazine at all. By Empire Strikes Back, they're pitting the rebel forces more on equal terms with, with the Imperials and it's much more of a, of a fair fight on Hoth. So they've come up with a more carbine version of the DH-17, which is pretty much what we've got here, but the proportions are slightly different. The shape of the front end is slightly different. Um, so that is, those are our two blasters, and we're very fortunate to have those. And Jonathan, do you feel like you are in a position to answer the age-old question in terms of stormtroopers' inaccuracy? Can we blame the kit, or can we blame the stormtroopers? Like, based on what you're looking at, is you know, should they be hitting more rebels? Should they be hitting more of our heroes in, in the movies? Some rebels, yeah, would be good. Um, <laughs> as I say, if you're, these are like the, I need to say future then, obviously we're, this is set in the distant past, not the future, but um, these are the futuristic equivalent of a submachine gun and they did, they're based off, upon a submachine gun. Now, if you try and fire a submachine gun from the hip without using the stock, which by the way, was a legitimate military uh, position and hold, in the 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, you know, the idea was at close range, you would look where you were aiming and, and the bullets slash laser bolts would go pretty much where you were aiming. So their, their, um, their tactics are, are maybe a bit, bit out of date, but yeah, you're not gonna hit a lot of what you're aiming at unless you have the stock unfolded, unless you use that fascinating looking optical sight that sits on top of your gun that no one ever uses in the movies. So it's partly kit and of course it's partly plot. Um, because you can't, you know, apart from winging a hero here and there, you can't possibly take out the good guys. Which, which, yeah, okay, so the, your standard stormtrooper is maybe like regular infantry. A little bit disappointed in the death troopers from, from Rogue One. You know, these guys are meant to be top-notch. They've got shoulder stocks. Um, they've got longer barrels as well. Does that matter for lasers? Who knows? 
but um but they were missing left right and center too so i'd say it's a bit, bit of hardware and a bit of convenience maybe it's the force quite possibly i mean regardless i think serious questions need to be asked of their training programs but it's probably probably a subject for another a whole nother stream um yep. so are we ready to move on to a few weapons that are um, a little more real um, than the ones we've, we've previously spoken about? Yeah, absolutely. We, we have some, some real space guns to talk about, which sounds like a contradiction in terms, but there are some. So I'll, I'll launch straight in. Uh, that was not a deliberate pun, sorry. Um, <laughs> um, with the Iraqi super gun, because believe it or not, that's the most space gun that we have tonight um literally a space gun that's a thing it means an earthbound gun for shooting things into space what would you what would you wish to shoot into space well uh weapons obviously or munitions is w one option people have fantasized about killing each other in space or perhaps sending something into space to that then comes down and does something horrible on the ground um uh, Jules Verne's um, From the Earth to the Moon is, is the first appearance of a space gun in that sense. And it's literally the, the, the most basic definition of a gun, a tube closed at one end, usually, although there are recoilless guns that aren't closed at one end, that fires a projectile. And if you just scale that up to ridiculous sizes, and you can see on the screen um, two sections of this Iraqi super gun that are on display at our Fort Nelson Museum, which is open at the moment. Um, there were eight sections of this recovered, and I'll explain why I'm being euphemistic about the word recovered in a second. And we have three. Two of them are, are assembled in the attitude they might have been in, had they been used. There are actually two super guns, um, project named Baby Babylon uh, and Big Babylon. So uh, you've got, well, I suppose I should, I should explain briefly where, where the heck these things come from. So there was a, a Canadian scientist called Gerald Bull. He was working for the US government on a program called HARP. Not that HARP, any conspiracy theory fans watching, the one with 1A, High Altitude Research Project. And that was turning artillery into, well, super artillery really, to try to, the idea was to get a satellite into orbit. That's the other use of a space gun, um, to get some sort of satellite into low Earth orbit. Spoiler alert, you can't do it with a space gun. It's not possible. Projectiles have reached the upper atmosphere into space, as it were, um, but not into a stable low Earth orbit, which is what you'd need for a satellite, of course. But Gerald Bull was trying very hard to make this happen. Um, so hard that he was prepared to go and work for Saddam Hussein's regime in the late 80s, which at that time was politically perhaps acceptable and was about to become very politically not acceptable, as um, those of you who uh, were alive or study your Cold War history will know. Um, Saddam Hussein was really not a nice man uh, and invaded Iraq in August 1990, at which point this project because um, Saddam had wooed Gerald Bull, Harp had collapsed, it was no longer a thing, there wasn't enough uh, benefits seen to be in that by the US government. He went to work for the other guys, who, as I say, when he went in the late 80s, were not so controversial, but became very controversial. So he designed for them initially artillery, battlefield artillery, not, what, not worth talking about here. And then Baby Babylon with a 46 meter barrel, um, 350 millimeter um, caliber bore, and Big Babylon was 150, which you can see on the screen at the moment. It, um, it's so big, it kind of goes off the screen. And, uh, and the, the zoomed in bit is the breach section, which we don't have. There, there isn't actually a breach section on display anywhere, as far as I know, which has recoil dampers in it, and it's how you get the thing loaded, of course. And the rest of it is just tubes, flanged tubes bolted together. And that was 156 meters long and a meter bore. The caliber was a meter in firearms terms anyway. Artillery uses, uses the word caliber slightly differently. Um, Sheffield Forge Masters down the road from us in Sheffield were manufacturing these, these barrel sections. Uh, and they they protested at the time when it was when it when the controversy came to light that 
British companies were making giant guns for foreign dictators, um, they pointed out that these had been commissioned as uh, petrochemical pipe pipe work. And it is, in fact, pipe work. It's just pipe work for firing massive shells or, or satellites. So this this was the the, the crux of the, of the controversy. There was there was a whole investigation which sort of then petered out and went away. Um, Sheffield Fortemasters survived and, and are still making legitimate things today, uh, which is good. Um, but yeah, this was a controversy at the time. Big question is was was Saddam Hussein wanting to create a satellite launcher, or was he creating a weapon of war? And we still don't really know. Um, that the UN concluded that the gun would have been too inaccurate for conventional armaments, but was, you know, possibility was that it was for chemical, biological or nuclear use. Once you'd set these big guns up, whether it's the 350 mil one or the, or the thousand millimeter wide one, they're pointing in the set direction. You can't aim them. They were working on versions that you could aim, and that would have been a threat to, well, Israel for one. Um, but on the face of it, there was space research going on. Now, so I, I personally, I, I suspect it was a bit of both. Uh, I suspect it was the kudos of having a Western scientist come up with these amazing outlandish weapons. Who really knows? Um, but it's a fascinating piece of history and, you know, a real space gun, um, which you can go and see and marvel at. And um, Jonathan, if, if we just talk about what um, we just said about, you know, whether or not Saddam did have um, sort of space exploration intentions or slightly more sinister ones. If we imagine, which I don't think will be too much of a stretch of a, the imagination that he did have more sinister intentions. What's the, I mean, the military value of having such a large fixed gun? Um, I mean, presumably it would have had to have been concealed or protected like the the Nazi V3 um, was in a huge bunker in France. So yeah. presumably... Saddam, I mean, this this weapon wasn't that valuable in, in the state that it kind of, in, in terms of the, the, the final inter iteration of Babylon? This this was the thing. So that the 350 millimeter gun that was actually fired, it was put on a hillside and fired. Um, as far as we can tell, Israel, who are the main sort of threat and the, the, the country most likely to do something about it, didn't seem to see that as much of a threat um, because, okay, they could get one shot off perhaps in their direction if it was pointed in the right direction. Um, but that would be it, because about an hour later, it would be obliterated by the Israeli Defence Force Air Force. Um, and that's a huge drawback, as you say, the V3 w was attempted to be concealed. But at least in those days, it would have been harder to lo pinpoint locate and get some flights of bombers over to, to knock it out. This is the, the London gun that was intended to, to reach as far as London, as you, as you alluded to. This this thing with modern satellites, modern um, jet bombers, yeah, it would have been annihilated almost immediately. And it's hard to see that this could have been practical for anything other than a one shot Hail Mary nuclear strike, which would then end Iraq as a, as a country and cause World War Three. So, yeah, I, again, very hard to say what the heck Saddam was thinking there. So a, a big win for British customs um, in that respect. Well, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, but but yeah, it, I, the, the consolation is that it would not have reached the point of being an existential threat to anyone because it would have been wiped out. Um, and, and unfortunately, Gerald Bull was assassinated, um, probably for his work on space rocket technology and, and missile rocket, sorry, missile rocket technology as offensive rocket technology, rather than the super gun work. Uh, but yeah, he, he was um, assassinated and it's not entirely clear who by. And in terms of space guns moving forward, is there any evidence that space guns are still being developed or did the idea sort of die with Mr. Bull? There was an attempt latterly around the early 2000s, if I remember rightly, to resurrect a space gun as a cheap way to get satellites into orbit. But I've, I've lost track of that. Um, as far as I know, it's not a goer, but uh, people might. No more. Okay, great. Uh, so are we moving swiftly on to our next? Yeah, topic? absolutely. Um, something that it was designed to go into space, but not to be used in space. So I won't, I won't spend forever on it, but we've got to cover it because it's the Cosmonaut Survival Pistol, uh, code uh, or designated TP-82, known as the Cosmonaut Survival Pistol. 
um, for anyone that comes across it online and goes, what the heck is that? Um, so the first thing to say, I suppose, is that this it's called a pistol. It's really more of a Mad Max sawn off shotgun, but it's a really Gucci one. Um, <laughs> it's a really nicely uh, made uh, firearm and it's technically what's called a drilling. So it's got um, two shotgun barrels side by side, like a, like a conventional shotgun that people b- will be familiar with. And then under the barrel, a rifle barrel, under the two barrels, sorry, a rifle barrel. So the, the, the true drilling was actually carried by Luftwaffe uh, air crew um, some of them anyway, as a survival weapon, because you've got the shot fired by the shotgun, convenient for hunting, for food, if you're behind enemy lines, or, or even if you're not behind enemy lines. Um, and then the rifle barrel, which was a 22 caliber in the um, drilling, which is great for small game. Again, that was very much a, a hunting, uh, expedient hunting weapon. This thing, it was a, a 5.45 millimeter rifle cartridge, same cartridge as the AK-74 was designed for. Than the Kalashnikov rifle. So a bit more potent, potentially. Potent, potentially. Um, but it's such a short barrel that, that the, the ballistics would have been pretty inferior. But nonetheless, you've got a, a considerably more accurate shot from the barrel below the two barrels. And then you've got your pattern shot coming out of the shotgun barrels. A, an attachable stock for better aim, which is great. Thinking of our stormtroopers from earlier. And the stock doubles as a hatchet which is not, I know we're not talking about the backward spinning hatchet attack for, for if people remember the early 2000s memes. Um, it's actually a hunting, a survival tool for cutting firewood. So this is a survival weapon. Why is it a cosmonaut survival pistol? Well, because, simply because it was on the inventory for the Soyuz capsules. It still is apparently, it's still on the inventory, but every time it's voted to remove it because there is this tension of weapons in space. Um, you know, no no nation should have weapons in space. That's that's kind of the um, uh, the feeling. So it's no longer carried. Also, the ammunition because it fires um, uh, shotgun ammunition uh, of, a, of a particular bore. I don't believe it's a standard twelve bore, twelve gauge um, flare ammunition of a, of a specific type. And I don't well less the five four five ammo is common, but some of the types of ammunition are apparently running out as well. So, and, and the only pictures and video you'll see of this thing online are of space tourists who have been given it to shoot at the range for jollies. Um, so it, it's been somewhat controversial. It was grandfathered into the sort of joint space effort um, because it was already a, a piece of kit that was carried. It's the only gun that's made it into space as a, as a, as a portable firearm that I know of, that anyone hopefully knows of. Um, designed by Alexei Leonov, I should say, um, who had been stranded, uh, who, who was a cosmonaut, stranded 600 miles away from civilization and only had a little, I imagine it was a Makarov, a little pistol to fight off bears and goodness knows what else. So that's the purpose of it. It's for fighting off dangerous animals and it's for um, getting meat to survive on. And Obviously, that was its primary use, Jonathan. But is there anything when you look at this gun that the designer has thought that maybe this would need to be used in space at all? Or are we saying this is a purely Earth-designed weapon? Purely Earth-based? I mean, I I guess there was some fear that someone might um, have an episode or something and use it on board the International Space Station. That's the sort of implied concern of some of these sort of minor protests that have happened. Um, And it would work. Um, I mean, there are uh, there are issues that I that I will come to in, in a moment of using guns in space. This one gets around a couple of them, so I'll um, I'll cover that in a moment. So it would work. For, okay, for maybe three shots. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. <laughs> um, so if I think if we move on to uh, our next weapon, I believe this one has a rather unfortunate name, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, the um, I could try and uh, pussyfoot around it, but I'm not going to. The gun itself is, is boringly titled the R23M Kartek. This is 1960s, 70s era, Cold War at its height, pretty much. And a, an existing aircraft gun, uh, the Noodle, Noodleman Richter, which is a terrible pronunciation, probably, NR23. 23 standing for the calibre, so it's a 23 millimetre cannon. 
aircraft tend to use by this time cannon, automatic cannon, firing big chunky shells that explode and do damage to the fabric of an aircraft, knock them down better than rifle bullets do. It's pretty much what previous machine guns were using. Anyway, this thing is um, redesigned and repackaged for use in space. And the mount, that plus the periscope sight, is designated the shit. The, forgive my pronunciation if you're Russian. That's the word. It's Russian for shield. And it is, in fact, a defensive weapon for a space station. Amazingly, it's a very cool idea. You see it on screen there. Very compact, short barrel. Uh, fitted in, you think it'd be in a turret. Right, so this is the this this uh, this plus the sight and mount and everything would have been called the sheet one. The sheet two was something else entirely. They they gave up on guns and went for a missile array, um, probably for good reason. So we don't know much about this, unfortunately. It's derived from, as I say, from the NR twenty three that was on MiG fifteen, MiG seventeen jets, um, highly highly derived. Um, it's got. I believe some sort of um, uh, cooling element around the barrel. This is very tentative, uh, speculative on my part. Um, I have spoken to my Russian contact and he's not aware either. You can see the, the ammunition storage on the top. You can see the chute underneath for getting rid of the, um, oh, sorry, that's for feeding. That's for feeding around the gun, the live cartridges. And then on the other side that you can't quite see, there's actually a, a tube for punting out the empty cases. This is not high-tech weaponry. This is an aircraft gun stuck on a space station. Originally designed for, would you believe this, um, a, a, a militarized Soyuz capsule, a spaceship with a gun on it originally. Now that one didn't go anywhere. That, that was the um, 7K VI um, Zvezda variant of the Soyuz. 1967, that project was canned. This was to, this was this thing, among other roles, was to tool around orbit, killing satellites with its space gun, which I just think is amazing, terrifying, um, but but amazing. The gun survived that project and was to was fitted to to the Almaz space station in 1975, and they did test firing uh, on the ground and they fired 20 shots in space. So an actual automatic cannon has been fired in space and the projectiles burned up in the atmosphere, apparently, uh, apparently, unsurprisingly. Um, so they, they say 950 rounds per minute, which is pretty, pretty high rate of fire. Uh, three kilometers range because there's no air resistance to, to show it down, slow it down. But you can only aim it. I'm not sure about the Soyuz capsule, but you can only aim it. But same would apply, I think, by moving the station. And you'd have to, they had to fire thrusters in the opposite direction, which is preempting one of the issues with guns in space, recoil. You shoot, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, of course. You fire a gun in one direction, you move in the other direction. And 20 rounds, they fired this in bursts, 20 rounds of big, heavy projectiles are gonna push, you, push the station backward. So they evacuated the station prior to, to firing and they did it before a deorbit as well. So there would be no risk of, cosmonauts being put at risk. So the, the, this, this then went nowhere um, and no one else, as far as I know, just like the, the portable firearm has tried to put a gun in space for this purpose. But amazingly, France by 2030 has stated an intent to put either a submachine gun, is the word that was in the press report on this, on space.com, or a laser weapon on a satellite. So, Countries are still trying to militarize space, even after the, the Soviet era closed. Um, and that, and unless you've got any thoughts on that, Jack, I'll go straight into the, the other issues with guns in space. Just wanted to express my surprise. I wasn't expecting you to say France. Uh, there were a few other countries higher on my list that I thought it yeah. might be. Not well, mentioning any um, names, but uh, France, yeah, there we go. <laughs> Yeah, France, they, they say that by 2030, whether they will or not is anyone's guess. There are, there's no treaty stopping them from doing it, huh. apparently. So why, why not then? Well, quite. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's not get too far into the ethics. Um, so re, as I say, there are problems with, with uh, guns in space, weapons in space, um, or, or projectile weapons in space, I should say. Uh, recoil is one, I've covered that. Um, vacuum is an issue, but not in the way depicted in Firefly, 
if anyone remembers an episode of Firefly where they had to put the gun in a spacesuit so that it would fire. That's not necessary um, because ammunition and other sorts of other people have covered this, of course, will tend to say that modern ammunition has its own oxidizer in the cartridge. Well, that's quite true, but so does black powder. Saltpeter is, is the oxidizer in black powder. So if any, any volunteers to go up into space and shoot a brown bess um, to, to just to prove me right, that'd be great. Um, any any well-off uh, space tourists watching? Um, don't, don't think they'd let you, but anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, gunpowder has its own oxidizing uh, agent and will burn, will fire in space, no problem. So that scene was cool, but not particularly well researched. Um, temperature is a huge problem uh, because it, uh, temperature in space and on the, because we're thinking here of the surface of other planets as well, of course, and, and of the moon, which I'm coming to, very low and very high temperatures. So the moon landings had to be timed just right so that the astronauts didn't freeze to death or, or cook, essentially, because you're looking at at least plus or minus 100 degrees Celsius, if, if I've done my research correctly. Now that's, that's a problem for, for the shooter. It's also a problem for the weapon in that it's either going to lower or increase chamber pressure. So you would have to design your gun to function. So it would affect lethality because lower pressure means lower velocity. It would affect safety because higher pressure means bigger boom. And if the thing, if the, if the gun can't take that high, that bigger explosion, it's going to explode. So it's not a showstopper, but it's a design consideration. Um, another one that, that's, that's come up, um, and I'll, I'll come to one of the major sources for this in a minute, people can go and read it for themselves, is what's called cold welding. So at the low end of the temperature spectrum, certain metals, uh, especially like metals, so, so titanium and titanium, for example, are particularly bad for this apparently, they will weld together because of the lack of an oxide layer between them. The oxide layer forms in air and there's no air in space. So the obvious way around that is to form an oxide layer and prevent. So this, this is obviously a problem for trigger mechanisms, feed mechanisms. If metal parts stick together permanently, your gun's going to fire once, if that, and stop. Even the hammer, even just a simple hammer flying forward could be stopped by friction weld, sorry, cold welding. But there are ways around that. Hard nitride coatings, um, ceramic coatings, letting it oxidize and then using it. But of course, if it wears through, that might be a problem. But also having looked up a little bit on this, um, cert, uh, bearing steels, standard carbon steels that you could make a gun out of, do not exhibit this problem in any particular serious way. So that's not a showstopper either. Lubricants, your, your standard gun oil will tend to gum up and, and stick and not work, but you can design a gun to run dry. The famous Sten gun, was designed to run dry and it's not known for its reliability um but but it would work it would well, you get a few shots out of it in space i, I want someone to design me a space stem gun now uh, so go away and do that after this um now the, the heating thing as i've said chamber pressure but also excessive heating without uh cases coming out of the gun potentially or even if you do have cases coming out of the gun the gun is going to overheat because the gun can't uh, convection um, can't happen. There's not enough air particles to, to convey the heat away from the gun. So heating's a problem. That might burn you or burn through your suit. And it might also um, cause cook-offs. If you watch some of the, the videos on YouTube where people deliberately melt down a gun to see what happens, they do exist. Um, the Kalashnikov company run a very fine channel that consists primarily of these videos. You will see occasionally when the gun gets super hot, it will fire spontaneously. You don't want that happening in space either. Um, sights are a consideration, but in a good way. They can be simple. You've got a very flat trajectory in space or on the moon even, less gravity, no air resistance. So, so the, the way you normally have to account for bullet drop, as people will know if you've done first person shooter video games or, or fired real guns, there's no real no bullet drop. Uh, velocity is not reduced significantly. So there are positives to having a gun in space. The weight of the gun and its ammunition is a huge factor for now, because um, as long as we have to get things into space, weight is a huge factor for actually getting up into orbit. It's partly why the Cosmonaut survival pistol is a pistol, 
and it's light as a result of that. So all, all of this is uh, covered in a 1965 report from Rock Island Arsenal that's available online if you Google it, entitled Meanderings of a Weapon-Oriented Mind When Applied in a Vacuum Such as on the Moon, which is a very snappy title. So that, that makes some interesting reading. Um, there, are, there are various solutions. I've, I've covered some. Um, the, the, the cosmonaut pistol would work for, for between one and three shots simply because it's mechanically simple. Three barrels with a hammer to, to fire them. There's no feed mechanism to get involved with. So that, that might work. And if you use the right lubricant, if they've used the right metals, that might work. Um, one of the solutions proposed in the meanderings of a weapon orientated mind, which we have a picture of for you, is the sausage gun. They don't, the, the author does not explain why he calls it the sausage gun, but I think when you see it, you'll get why. And this is, this is a great way to achieve, to, to, to avoid some of these problems. Minimal metal and metal contact, separate barrels that are each fire separately, um, and it's compact, it's lightweight. It's essentially, uh, it's like a pepper box. Uh, revolver but without the revolving mechanism or um, almost like a, a diver's bang stick in a way but with multiple shots so that that's another way around it um, so, so, so it's not we can do guns in space but your kind of call of duty infinite warfare ar-15 in, with a few bits stuck to it is probably not the way forward uh, another possibility um, as well, I love the fact with the sausage gun that it also has a like a, a belt clip, so you can put it in your shirt pocket as well. Um, in in that image, you, you would also have seen a uh, piece of ammunition that he that the guy speculates upon, and that's a flechette, because a key thing, another advantage of guns in space or on the moon or whatever, as he's talking about, is that um, you can have lightweight, high velocity projectiles that that they might not stop a soldier on Earth but they will penetrate a space suit and that's basically you out of the fight if you're in a space fight. So that's why they've gone for a saboted um, flechette for that imaginary gun, the sausage gun. Um, quickly, because uh, I'm running out of time, um, we're going to mention the gyrojet because it looks like a space gun and might well function as well because it's a rocket bullet, which sounds nuts. It's in a James Bond film, um, and I've forgotten which one. Somebody in the comments will, will tell us, no doubt. And it's uh, a very simple piece of pressed, pressed metal. It's like, it's like a cheap, it's like a toy gun when you pick one up. Very, very light. Simple feed mechanism. You still have to worry about your metal bonding issue. But then um, the hammer, which goes backwards, hits the nose of the miniature rocket. It's very Warhammer 40k. Um, in fact, I think we did, we did another video with GameSpot where, where we touched on how bolters might work. And the gyro jet was a good candidate for that. Um, so, so it hits the projectile, fires a cap in the base, just like a normal round, but then it just accelerates out of the, the gun like a bottle, like a rocket out of a bottle, it's basically what it is. Uh, perfectly lethal, similar to, to a handgun, normal modern handgun. Um, and who knows, could have, could have worked in space, but it was not designed for it. So we, we will not dwell upon it. We might have another couple of images for you as we speed through. Incidentally, other, other possibilities would be, well, air guns. There's no reason why you couldn't design an air gun that would work in space. Um, harpoon guns may well work. Um, something called an air bow, which is basically an arrow um, shot out of a, an air gun. Bows themselves though, probably not going to work because they rely on fletchings to stabilize the the, uh, the arrow or the crossbow bolt um, and there's no air for those to work so any any upset imparted by the bowstring and there's nearly always upset and for arrows work by flexing uh, when you see them in slow motion it's just going to tumble off it's probably going to hit your space enemy flat on and not do any good so those, those aren't great and our kind of um, grand finale, really, as far as I'm concerned, although we might talk about a bit more if there's time, is the amazing Project Horizon, uh, which is probably second only to the Pulse Rifle as my favorite space gun thing ever. Even, even, the, even the Soviet space station gun. So this is a report, this is another great report you can go and find. Um, if you head to the Small Arms Review website, they've got the version of the report, volume three, 
of the Project Horizon report from 1959, US government report. The other two volumes are easily available on, online, but this one seems to have disappeared. You can find it on the Small Arms Review site. Have a look, it's incredible. So this was the idea that in 1959, America would not only be on the moon, but could have a moon base. What they do when they encounter the Nazis on the other side of the moon, I don't know. Um, there's, there's a documentary, or is it, is it a film about that called Iron Sky? Um, so, so this was projected by 1965, which is hugely ambitious, of course. Now their weapon, which is, which is on screen uh, now, is cut, cutting to the chase here, because there's a lot in that report that isn't about this, is essentially a Claymore mine on a stick. So you take the Claymore mine, which is a directional anti-personnel mine um, with, a, with a ball bearings and a backing of explosive. And that sets these ball bearings off at high velocity in a set trajectory, fairly set trajectory. On Earth, again, subject to air resistance, going to drop off. It's got a, a maximum lethal radius of 150 feet. On the moon, brilliant weapon, because tiny little fast traveling projectiles will penetrate spacesuits out to, I don't know, 200 meters or something, probably more probably way more, no air resistance. So as well as coming up with perimeter defense systems using claymores adapted to stick in moon dust, um, they also came up with the claymore on a stick, which they called the uh, handheld directional mine, which is a bit cooler than claymore on a stick. And so the, the, the Buck Rogers looking um, sensor dish, that's not a dish, that's, that's just to stop the flash from blinding you when you fire this thing. It's electrically fired, you plug it into, I don't know, a car battery on the back of your spacesuit or something. Um, it's, AAAs aren't going to cut it for this. So it's electrically fired, just like a Claymore mine is. Very simple, very achievable, and it would work. Um, the recoil, yeah, that, that's still a significant mass of metal going the other way. So you might need to brace yourself. Bearing in mind, this is meant for fighting on the moon, amazingly. Um, and you can see in, in the image that's on the screen, uh, hopefully at the moment, some little cartoon spacemen getting murdered by the, um, by the handheld directional mine, which is kind of hilarious and disturbing at the same time. And the other thing that's in uh, the Project Horizon report, uh, I'd love to see the face of the, the generals who read this, is um, something that already existed, which is just nuts, uh, a nuclear recoilless gun. So the, the handheld directional mine is a space gun designed for a specific application very cleverly, actually. I'm sure it would work. The Davy Crockett is a 120 millimeter recoilless gun, a spigot recoilless gun. So you stick the projectile on the front, but it's still a gun. So it's qualified. Um, I think we classify it as artillery, um, heavy weapon these days, but nonetheless. And it's a nuclear warhead. If you've ever played the Fallout, the 3D Fallout games, I think at least, the Fat Man rocket launcher is the Davy Crockett fired from the shoulder, which in reality, um, it, although it's recoilless, um, it's not quite, it still needs a mount to support an aim. And you don't want to shoulder fire a nuclear bomb, really. You don't really want a tripod fire one either, but <laughs> that didn't stop the US government from designing it and building quite a few of them. You can actually see those in museums um, in the States. Just crazy. So yeah, we could have had um, astronauts brassing each other up with claymore mines on sticks, um, electrically fired. We could have had nuclear exchanges on a tactical level, space suit, spaceships blowing up. Had the Russians and the Americans met each other on the moon. So I think we can all be quite grateful that they didn't. Um, so I think that is probably a good time to conclude the sort of uh, Jonathan section of uh, this discussion, although obviously you're going to feature quite uh, heavily in the next part, hopefully as well. <laughs> um, but yes, if, if people want to start um, sending in their questions now, um, and we'll probably go for about the next 15 or so minutes, um, answering as many of those as we can. Um, we I just need to give a couple of shouts out to uh, Paul White Lamb on Facebook and Jabba Daha on YouTube, who told us uh, the Bond film was You Only Live Twice, um, which I'm sure you yeah. know, Jonathan. Uh, so, um, <laughs> yeah, so if everyone wants to just keep those questions coming in, there's quite a few to be getting on with. Um, I'm going to jump the queue and ask you one, Jonathan, if that's all right. Um, in your opinion, uh, I mean, we've looked at lots of sort of lots of sci-fi guns, lots of 
futuristic looking guns, maybe from the sort of uh, late latter half of the 20th century. Where are where is weaponry going in the 21st century? What are the big things that we should be talking about? Um, yeah, what's what's exciting to you in this sector? Uh, in small arms, it's not terribly exciting, I'm afraid. <laughs> Uh, we've given up on case lists that I was talking about earlier. Pretty much have given up. The only realistic prospect is something called case telescoped ammunition. So you get around most of the drawbacks of, of caseless, um, too much heat being a biggie, and destructible ammunition being another big one. You know, it needs to, if, you, if your casing's made out of propellant, it's quite vulnerable. That's that's always been one of the problems of caseless. So plastic cased ammo, basically. Now, that might not sound terribly exciting, and in some ways it's not, but it does require new engineering. So we're, we're seeing, if people want to look up the, the next generation squad weapon, NSGW, that's the current American exploratory program to find weapons to fire, well, more conventional ammunition of a very high velocity, but also some of them are these case telescoped rounds. And so you're looking at a pivoting breech to be able to extract and feed something that doesn't have a rim to 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 pull out and shove in the case. So exciting to those of us that study these things, perhaps not to those of us expecting pulse rifles. The other answer is that we already have directed energy weapons, um, not in space as far as I know, although there is a Soviet era laser pistol, which looks the part, but it's actually a dazzler for um, interfering with or destroying sensors on incoming missiles or, or spacecraft, or for uh, blinding astronauts which unfortunately that went nowhere, but that is a real thing on the battlefield now, controlled by international treaty, but nonetheless, you, you, there are now laser guns that are strong enough to burn retinas, to put it bluntly. And so, so those already exist. Um, who knows where that will go? We have rail guns on warships. We have laser guns that can shoot down aircraft on warships, on um, aircraft, but they're all experimental at the moment. You can, you can fit them on a Humvee uh, vehicle. That's that's about it. So that all of that getting smaller and more powerful as battery technology and improves and laser technology improves means we might start to see energy weapons, but they're liable to be heavy weapons. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so if we go over to some questions that are flying in. Um, Richard Daborn on YouTube has asked, the pulse rifles were all different. Each one was slightly different from the next. Do you know how they differed? Um, I have quite a few notes on this that I won't, I won't bore you to death with, but yes, absolutely. All the, all the props end up being different, either at, either at the beginning of filming or at the end or both, where they're modified and get damaged and stuff. Um, and they change, if they're rebuilt for other films like ours, they get changed as well. So you had pulse rifles that only had um, the gun that fired, like like ours was, didn't it never had a grenade launcher shotgun inside it. Um, you had, if I remember rightly, two live fire units that had both and would have made weighed an absolute ton because you've got two guns plus parts of other guns. You know, this thing's probably meant to be lightweight space age technology, but it's a pig. You know, even ours with only the one gun in it. Um, you had um, something I, I've been in touch with a couple of guys that own them, the resin stunt versions. There, there are at least seven of those around. There would have been presumably more than a dozen originally. Those are, those are cool bits of movie history in their own right. Um, and you had versions with them without the counter, the famous counter that counts down as you shoot and, and counts up when you insert a magazine. So yeah, the, the, I, they're all different in terms of being having different damage on them. But then there are subsets. So you've got two that are fully live firing. Um, well, seven that, ex that exist that would have been one or the other gun. And then the resin ones. They're the ones I know about. OK, uh, we have one coming in from uh, Hugh Hamlin. Um, and he says, was the black version of the G11 uh, that we were speaking about earlier, was that an earlier version before the more slab sided green one? Yes, that picture is actually of our mock-up. We only have a, a wooden mock-up from relatively early in the trials in the 70s. Um, and it's the earlier type. Uh, it got slab-sided and chunky, as, as the um, commenter's saying. And um, the final version is what was submitted to the American Advanced Combat Rifle Trials. Um, 1990, if I remember rightly. 
So it, did, it had its, it evolved. It, it was a, a very much a prototype for a long time. And the version that was kind of pre-production that the Germans were, were potentially going to get and then the Americans trialed but didn't, didn't really like was the version that you're thinking of with a different front end on it and it's chunkier. Um, yeah, so that's, that's absolutely right. The magazine, by the way, goes on the top from the front and, and it actually reciprocates back and forth when you fire it. There's a couple of videos on YouTube of it working. Okay, um, another question here about the, the Metal Storm gun, um, mm. and whether that would solve uh, some of the problems you were talking about, about firing weapons in space. Um, what do you think to that? Potentially, yeah. Um, something I didn't mention, but that sausage gun, as they called it, was, I believe, what, well, it is, one saboted um, or saboted um, flechette per barrel. Things like Metal Storm, as the commenter will know, question asker will know, are what's called in antique firearms superimposed loads so powder bullet powder bullet powder bullet and metal storm was ignited electrically rather than with a sliding flintlock or something as we have in the collection which, which is very cool um firing you've got to fire the front one first obviously if you fire one of the back ones you're in for a bad day because you've essentially got a pipe bomb but yeah why not um eliminating moving parts as much as possible would be advantageous in space I've even idly speculated in my mind that the pulse rifle might have some sort of superpose. Just because you get that, that fascinating rising, falling report as the, as the rounds are fired, that's just movie magic. But, you know, that and the, and the 99 round capacity, maybe you're looking at some sort of plasma ignited rocket ball ammunition. People know what rocket ball ammunition is. It's another antique thing. But yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know. Right, this is probably quite subjective for you, Jonathan. But um, Jabba Dahat asks on YouTube, uh, "What is the rarest gun that the Royal Armouries own?" Oh, uh, yeah, I've got a few of those. I've um, got a few serial number ones. Uh, got a serial number one Luger. We've got the first ever SA80. That might not be worth much. Um, first ever uh, SLR rifle, and so on and so forth. So, so, the, so there are those. They're all unique in their own way, even if they're not the only series that was built of that like the three serial number one lugas for example um but we, we've got unique things that belong to specific individuals um we've got a submachine gun that belonged to winston churchill that's a sterling so um winston churchill had a stormtrooper blaster who knew um we hope to put that on display at some point um it, it, it goes on i mean if you're talking about technology not quite unique but the 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 belton carbine uh, which has got a bit of traction online in recent years when when that was kind of revealed as a as a piece of old rapid fire technology it's not as rapid fire as people think but that is both almost well, it's not unique but there are only I only know of 3 i think and that's superimposed loads and in a magazine so you remove the breech the breech is a magazine it's a bit like a g11 but it goes in the back and then it's got a flint lock on the side and i i could go on for days about stuff that's unique or nearly unique in the collection um and we have spoken quite a lot about real life influencing sci-fi movies um and and fiction generally um are there many examples of it happening the other way around and uh science fiction actually influencing real life combat weaponry yeah someone actually did try to get to the bottom of this with um the F2, Belgian F2000 rifle, I believe it was. And somebody actually asked the designers the question and, and that was in development around about the same time as Halo, which is the gun that it looks a lot like, the, the assault rifle from Halo. So we, do, we don't quite know. I think, I, think um, I need to do some research on this and actually interview some designers who are you know, my age and younger, and I'm sure are influenced. And people are thinking, well, fashion doesn't affect modern firearms design. It absolutely does, just like it always has. And there are several designs that started as sort of fag packet sketches of something cool and sci-fi, the Israeli Tavor being one of them, that then got designed working parts to go in them. So it doesn't always start with the ideal mechanism and then we fit it with workman-like materials or whatever. Sometimes it works on what's cool. So some of these high-tech plastic bullpup rifles may well, the G36, I, I've got, got to see a bit of a pulse rifle influence in that, but that might be just be me. And I think we probably have time just for one last question, Jonathan. Um, and I think we will go with, this one's from Paul Whitelam on Facebook. Um, and if you could purchase any film gun for the collection, Jonathan, which would you buy? 
I'm going to be really boring. Um, <laughs> say the even nicer pulse rifle that I, <laughs> I thought you might <laughs> you on Google uh, or or anything that links through to Google uh, Teams as well. If you if you work with me, the my profile picture is me with a stupid grin on my face holding the first pulse rifle I ever got my hands on, and it's not ours. It's it's one of the two dual re, dual unit pulse rifles. So and it had its and, and one of only two with the original metal casing on it because ours and all of the others that, that exist, they had to replace the casings with plastic ones for Alien 3 because they trashed all the others. So this, um, this was made by a, a race, racing car engineer called Morris Gomm to the designs that Cameron had made. And so that was like Aliens fan heaven. So it's the boring answer is the gun we've already got, but the even nicer one, <laughs> which by the way is worth unbelievable amounts of money. Okay, so we're going to need everybody to donate very heavily uh, at the end of this chat. And Jonathan, uh, just very, very quickly, someone has asked if you have been on your tea making course yet after <laughs> your controversy oh, earlier earlier in the oh, year. A bit beneath the belt, that one. But, oh, um, that is that is. I assume yeah. that's come from across the pond. Well played, very yeah. well played. You don't need to respond. You don't need to lower yourself to respond to that one if you don't want to. Um, I need no such course. <laughs> <laughs> We're rising I, above I, that I one. I have written an article. I have written a 5,000 <laughs> word article on uh, milk in first and last. So, so come out with a few more and I'll make you all read it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that one definitely hit home. Uh, right. So I think on that note, we will uh, end tonight's broadcast. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time. That's been really, really fascinating. I've really enjoyed that. I think uh, judging by a lot of the comments and questions, no um, everybody else has on uh, on YouTube and Facebook. So that just leaves me to remind you all to check out our events. Um, we have, as I said earlier, a chat, uh, a lecture tomorrow, and we have two further live, live streams on Wednesday and Thursday next week. Um, so they're definitely not to be missed. Um, and yet yeah, just another reminder that we are a charity and uh, anything that you guys can donate would be very much appreciated. Um, so yeah, other than that, thanks so much for tuning in. Uh, see you next time. Uh, and yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks everyone, take care.